I'm a lawyer of justice at work. My job is to provide legal support, employment, and labor legal services to immigrant worker centers. Worker centers are community organizations where workers go when they have no place left to turn, they haven't been paid their wages, they got injured on, injured on the job, or they feel discriminated against. The centers provide information, organize workers, help them get legal services, and advocate on their behalf. The other day I was in a worker committee meeting in Lynn, and a new worker had joined the committee, and he mentioned to the group that he had a connection with the radio station. And the organizer, the staff member of the center, his eyes lit up, you could tell he was excited, he said, hey, you know, maybe I could go with you someday and we could get on the air and we could talk about the work that the center is doing. And the gentleman, he's from the Dominican Republic, he said, Cogelo suave, este es un bolero, no merengue. Take it easy. This is a bolero, not a merengue. This is a slow, romantic song, not a fast party song. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that quotation says a lot. For one, it's in Spanish. So if you're hoping to do this type of work, you better understand Spanish. But second, the message is, if we're involved in social change work, if we're involved in empowering this community, this is gonna happen one step at a time. So the mission of Justice at Work is to provide legal support that supports organizing work, organizing immigrant workers, and particularly the organizations that are doing that work. I think this photo captures our theory of change and the way we want to do our work. This is a press conference where the Centro Comunitario de Trabajadores, a community worker center in New Bedford, is announcing an agreement that they've reached with a temp agency. This is a temp agency that claims to place around 1,400 workers per day in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. It's an agreement that's going to give the workers rights that state and federal law doesn't provide them, such as vacation pay. And a means by which the workers will be able to be in communication with the management. What's really telling about this photo, I think, is that we, Justice at Work, myself, we're in the background, we're sitting down, we're taking notes, and we're listening. As that quotation described, this is es un bolero no merengue, what this is really about is forming strong relationships. And in that work, especially as a, a white privileged person, coming into this community, there's three pieces that I've found have been both uh, critical, very critical, in whether or not we've been successful or not so successful in the work we're doing. And that's been the ability to listen, to step back and listen, the ability to become comfortable with conflict, and then ultimately having gratitude for the things that the work does provide. One of the exciting things about working with worker centers is that we're not only taking on workplace issues, we're not only taking on direct economic justice issues, but also these organizations become a voice for working class people in general. This is the Brazilian Immigrant Center who we partner with at the State House, lobbying for license, uh, licenses for all immigrants here in Massachusetts. So although it's not an explicit workplace related issue, it's clearly top priority for the folks that we're working with. The question is why? Why is it so important that the people who are most affected by these problems be the ones figuring out the solution and then acting upon that, being the protagonist, if you will, in creating the social change? Why not just have really smart people who happen to go to Harvard Law School and are very articulate and could be elected into office who could engineer a successful society? I was talking about this with our board president who's a mother of three children in, in BPS, she's raised them in Boston Public Schools, and she mentioned the busing that happened here in the 70s. That was something that ultimately came through a federal court order, a white judge who lived in Wellesley at the time. And nothing wrong with the federal court order, and nothing wrong with the um, ideal of desegregating the schools, but if you know the result, it ended up being very ugly. It played out on the national scene, and it pitted working class white people against working class African Americans here in the city. When I was in law school, my friends didn't want to come to visit me here in Boston because they heard of how racist a town it is. And what was ignored in, in that process was the voice of the people most affected 
And really the big issue, which, which is that there weren't the resources available and education wasn't a big enough priority for society at that time. Another reason why, I think we need to keep in mind some of the statistics. The society that we're in today, whether you're morally outraged or just practically concerned about the well-being of your children or grandkids, 44% of children in the U.S. grow up in low-income families. That's uh, twice the level of poverty or below. A full-time worker here in Massachusetts earning the minimum wage makes less than $17,000 a year. So you can work and still be poor. Unions represent about 6.7% of the private workforce in the United States of America, and that's a big reason why we have these issues at the workplace. Forty years ago, if you worked, you were building power. If the economy was growing, working class people were being empowered. Today's, today, that's not the case. The economy in the United States continues to grow, and working class people continue to lose out. For the community we're working with, other key statistics, 400,000 people a year are being deported from the United States of America. Estimated 11.7 million people are undocumented. So imagine what it's like to stand up for your rights at the workplace. Justice at Work was born to try to be an innovative way to take the little amount of resources and privilege that we have and have the largest impact possible. So we only provide our labor, and our labor and employment legal services to the members of these worker centers. We provide trainings to their staff and to the worker members. And as I mentioned before, I think really as I reflect over the last three years of doing this work, listening has been really critical. Going to law school, all right, the kind of educational background that we have, we are taught to know things. We have a lot of information in our brains. We've seen a lot of TED Talks. <laughs> We have been taught to be articulate, to have the answer. One thing I've realized is that when I'm asked to do an intake of a member of a worker center, I might notice within two minutes that there's no legal claim. But really what my job is in that moment is to sit and help strengthen the relationship between the organization and that individual. Because ultimately the strength of these organizations is just made up of the individuals who feel like they have ownership and they have a voice at that organization. So to the extent I've been able to listen to that story and then think, how can we plug that sense of injustice into the proactive work that that organization is doing, then we've accomplished something. Comfort with conflict. I get a lot of phone calls from opposing counsel saying, what are you doing now? All right, when a group of workers and an organizer are on the front steps of the owner of a company. Miles Horton, who was a critical white ally during the labor movement and the civil rights movement, he often said that when well-intentioned people don't take into account the fact that for poor working class people, conflict is an everyday reality. They're getting up and going to work, cause, not because they want to go to that job, but because they have to get food and put a roof over their head. When well-intentioned people don't take that into account, when they support the working class's response to those conditions, then they're actually getting in the way of the flowering of self-determination, was the way he put it. So in other words, if I would say we, okay, I grew up in Newton, Massachusetts, very privileged white person, safest city in America it was voted when I was a kid. All right, the gentleman in the picture before grew up in uh, the middle of an armed conflict in Guatemala. He witnessed firsthand atrocities that I couldn't imagine happened to his own family. All right. To the extent I can't become comfortable with that level of conflict, I can't really empower that community. And that goes back to my own personal relationships with the organizers and workers. If they come to me and say, hey, we got this plan to assassinate the business owner, I'm not going to be on board. <laughs> what this quote, I think, is really about is my personal interactions day to day. And to the extent workers aren't expressing their disagreement with me, to, express, to the extent they're not making fun of me for being this tall white guy, that means that I haven't accomplished my relationship with the community members. And it, it goes back and forth. But it's not necessarily something that I learned growing up in Newton, Massachusetts. Finally, gratitude. This is an interesting case. It's an ongoing case. We actually have a mediation on Monday. And I think all these workers plan to show up to that mediation. 
Good example of how the legal and the organizing has worked together. This is a class action lawsuit, a temp agency that provides workers to a third party client, job done, supplies workers to Fulfillment America, who then provides packaging to Dunkin' Donuts and Subway. All right, this is how the United States of America, this is how the whole world works, right? So there's a class action lawsuit for non-payment of overtime. The temp agency didn't pay overtime. Fulfillment America says we have nothing to do with it, right? And since the lawsuit was filed, workers are now receiving overtime. There's been direct actions by the organization uh, visiting the, the company. Since then, the transportation charges that the temp agency uh, used to charge have been cut in half. And a supervisor who was really problematic has been fired. That happened because of the direct action by these workers. It's important in, when we do this work to remember those little victories. These are long hours. It's not always easy to listen first. It's not always easy to step back. It's not easy to get co comfortable with conflict. It's not always easy to accept half the salary your friends are making who you went to law school with. Make it a third or a fourth sometimes, <laughs> right? But a big part of this too is the gratitude, the recognition of what one receives. Day in and day out, I'm interacting with incredibly inspiring people. The life stories of the members of these worker centers is mind boggling. So leave aside the fact that I now have the ability to speak Spanish or Portuguese or certain enriching things in my own personal life. The relationships that I've formed, it's liberating for me. There's a, there's a common experience here. The liberation is going both ways. And that's really the only way it's going to be long term. To the extent it feels like a self-sacrifice, we're going to come across as patronizing and we're going to burn out. I shared this message with a friend of mine from law school last night and he said, oh, I see, it's always all about the white man. And so I think this is a difficult concept to talk about, right? Because on a certain level, I am enriched by the work I do. But the only way I could have that relationship last night with my friend was that we have a relationship. We're close, we talk about these kinds of things. Without that, one could be objectifying, right? It all comes down to to what extent have you fully met? Can you talk through these difficult issues? I come back to this quotation, cógelo suave, ese es un bolero, no merengue. And it connects in some ways to what I was just talking about, right? I can't remember the last time that I listened to non-Latin music when in my car. That's part of the experience of doing this work. It's, it's living day to day with the, the folks that you're doing the work with and allowing yourself to receive from that, but doing it in a relationship. So it's been really an uh, interesting experience for me to come here and be able to reflect a little bit on these last three years. We're, we're, I founded the organization. Actually yesterday, our second attorney just started. So this is something that takes a lot of effort, but I really believe that it's possible for us to bridge these gaps. Um, coming from the world of, of such privilege, I, I know one student who came to Harvard Law School and he said for him, it was a bigger cultural change coming here than it was going to study abroad in Chile. So for me coming out of law school, it was really critical to be able to listen be comfortable with the type of conflict that was existing in those communities and just be grateful for the fact that I had the capacity to build those relationships. Thank you very much.